tonight's speaker, uh, Dean Jacqueline Joseph Silverstein. She is our Dean and CEO here at UW Sheboygan. She joined us uh, in January 2013. And prior to coming to our campus, she completed her master's degree in biology from Emory University and her PhD in developmental biology from the City University of New York. She spent two years as a postdoctoral fellow at NYU Medical Center and was a faculty member teaching developmental and cell biology at St. John's University, where she also ran a research lab focusing on the role of a particular chemical signal in the development of the cardiovascular <coughs> system. So tonight, being uh, Joseph Silverstein is going to talk to us about understanding adult stem cells. Thank you. Thanks for all coming out in this cold weather tonight with promise of still a few more uh, snow flurries. What I'm going to do tonight is take you on a journey through a field of biology that's called developmental biology. This is the field that actually is the foundation for what we know about adult stem cells today and the kinds of studies that are happening right now in this field. I'll tell you a little bit about what developmental biology is in a moment, but first I want to show you a brief movie and hopefully this will help you to understand why I became so enamored of this field and needed to study it for, oh, about 15 years. The fertilized ovum undergoes rapid divisions and forms a blastula. Each division normally takes about 30 minutes. The blastula develops into a gastrula. folds develop and fuse to form the spinal cord and brain. Eventually, the embryos hatch as free-swimming tadpoles, or larvae. The tadpoles undergo metamorphosis, and tiny frogs emerge that eventually grow into adults. So, this is the field of developmental biology, and those of us who study this field are very, very interested in understanding how you can go from a single fertilized egg to a complex multicellular organism made up of many, many different cells and tissues. So you start out with a single fertilized egg, it divides and becomes a ball of cells. One of the things you saw there over time was that ball of cells seemed to be changing a little and cells seemed to be moving. And what's happening there is the embryo is then forming three layers. And I'll talk a little bit about those three layers later, but I didn't bring a snack with me. I brought what might be some visual aids. So this would be the ball of cells. This would be a really early embryo that we call a blastula. And what happens is at one end, it begins to, it begins to kind of drop in and cells move along the outside and move in 
inside to form the three germ layers. Then the other thing you heard him talk about was the formation of the neural tube in the brain. And what happens is on the outside of this three-layered embryo at that point, on one part of it, the cells again begin to move and fold and they form a pocket like that and the pocket comes together and closes with the top being the brain and the remainder being the neural tube which goes on to become the spinal cord. So you've all heard of a spina bifida, children that are born with spina bifida. That happens because the, when the neural tube doesn't close all the way, there's some kind of genetic abnormality where their closure doesn't take place. So how does all of this happen? How do we um, end up with three layers of cells and then an organism with a brain and a spinal cord? Developmental biologists are the people who study the mechanisms for how those things happen. The field of developmental biology is well over 100 years old. The earliest studies were basically done just by looking at embryos like this one through a microscope and watching what happened and then doing some manipulation of cells to see what would happen if you destroyed one cell in a four-celled embryo. How does that impact development of the rest? To now, using molecular biology and genetic engineering to try to get deeper and deeper into an understanding of how an organism develops. This is just a picture of that ball of cells I was telling you about when it has formed the, the three germ layers. The, you've, and I'll talk a little bit about those germ layers in a minute, but if you were to cut this orange in half, if this was an embryo, a three-layered embryo, this is what you would see. And these are frog embryos. Human embryos develop a little bit differently, and I'll mention that briefly when we talk a little bit later on about embryonic stem cells. So how does all this happen? Well, the first thing you, have, you need to understand is a little bit of cellular biology. And I've been showing uh, the top part of this slide, oh, for probably over 20 years now, um, because I always remember when I was in elementary school and the teachers would tell us the cells are the building blocks of life. And I'd always picture like this brick wall. And these were the cells. They were these inert things that were just sitting there. And then you get a little more advanced in school and they start telling you, well, cells have organelles inside. They have the nucleus inside that contains the DNA. And they have the mitochondria that are the powerhouse of the cell. And then I was kind of picturing this brick wall but they had organelles in them, they had nuclei in them. Well, this is not what cells are at all. Cells are, are, they behave, they have behaviors. They can divide, just like you saw in the movie. They move. As I said, these cells are moving around in these embryos to form these three layers. They send signals to each other. Cells can, can send signals and cells can respond to signals. They stick to each other to form sheets. And sometimes it's in sticking to each other that those signals are, are um, sent from one cell to another. And then cells also become differentiated to perform specific tasks. You have an egg and then you have neurons that form specific tasks of sending uh, nervous impulses through the body. You have a liver with hepatocytes that have digestive enzymes in them. You have, car you have muscle cells that contract. Those are all differentiated cells. They have specific functions. They're not the same as the egg or those early cell divisions that we saw earlier. So when the cells form those three layers, each one of those layers goes on to become particular sorts of tissues. And the three germ layers, as you might, can, you can kind of tell by the names, ecto is outer, so the ectoderm is the outer layer of cell, endo is the inner layer of cells, and the mesoderm is the middle layer of cells. And each one of these layers contains the precursors of all of the cells that make up the tissues that you see here. 
So when I was doing research, I was specifically focused on the cardiovascular system. And so I was looking at cells that were, that were derived from this middle layer or the, or the mesodermal layer. So I mentioned cell differentiation. I said that's one of the behaviors of cells. They divide. Well, what is differentiation? Differentiation is the process by which cells become specialized. And it happens in sort of a sequential way. The egg is what we call totipotent. It's able to make any kind of cell type at all in the body. Over time, a cell's fate begins to be narrowed somewhat, and then cells are pluripotent. Pluri means many. They can become many different types of cells if they're in the right environment and treated the right way, and then ultimately they're differentiated. They're only one cell type. They have a job to do, and they can only do that job. Now, when I was doing, these, doing research, we believe that this pathway could not be reversed, that it was irreversible. You could never go from a differentiated cell back to a pluripotent or a totipotent cell. And what I'm going to talk to you about uh, for at least half of the night tonight is, shows exactly that, that we can go from a differentiated cell to a pluripotent cell if we treat the cells appropriately. And the whole adult stem cell field as it exists today is based on the ability to reverse that so that differentiated cells can become pluripotent again and therefore become many different kinds of cells. And this is just a little diagram that the, the fertilized egg would be on top and the fertilized egg would have the capacity to become any of these eight or nine different cell types. But over time, you see the branches, cells have a lesser and lesser ability to go on to become particular cell types. Their fates become narrow. Eventually, they are differentiated and they do the job there they were determined to do, to secrete digestive enzymes or to contract like a skeletal muscle would contract. So stem cells, stem cells are cells that are able to renew themselves and stay in an undifferentiated form, but they're also able to differentiate into mature cells. So the um, Example of stem cells that we have the most knowledge about, we meaning everyone in this room, is our bone marrow cells. So we know that we have stem cells in our bone marrow that can go on to differentiate into white cells or red cells or blood platelets. Those cells are able to renew themselves. So you always have a pool of stem cells that, when necessary, go on and differentiate into each of these different cell types that make up the blood. And a lot of the early work in this field was done on blood cells. So how do cells become differentiated. Remember I talked about the fact that cells can send signals and cells can respond to signals. Well, the whole process of differentiation is based on cellular signals. And this is just a diagram of the surface of a cell. And on the cell, you have something called a receptor. And a receptor, could kind of, you can kind of think of it like an antenna. And there are thousands and thousands of receptors that respond to different kinds of molecules on the surface of the cells. And when the right molecule comes in contact with the receptor, it sends a signal inside the cell. And there's a whole cascade of things that happens that scientists have been studying for 20 plus years now that then tell a cell to behave in a particular way. When we're talking about differentiation, much of what happens is the signal that is sent inside the cell somehow impacts the DNA in the nucleus and it impacts gene expression. So gene expression, DNA genes are on the DNA. They can be transcribed to RNA. RNA is then made into proteins. Okay, not there are some 
There were some, those who were, who were molecular biologists know there are some other things that can happen too, but that's kind of the, the basic tenet. And so what happens, what we know about differentiation, is that some of the chemical signals come from the outside of the cell like this. There are actually other signals in the cytosol. That's the cytoplasm, the, bat, the, set, the soup that's inside the sac, that's the cell. And they all interact with the genes inside the nucleus to turn genes on or to turn genes off. So the word differentiation means becoming specialized or different from every other cell type, and the process by which this occurs we call differential de gene expression. Different genes are turned on at different times, and there are factors in the cytoplasm that bind to DNA, that's a kind of a simplistic way to think about it, and turn certain genes on and turn certain genes off. And I think this is kind of a neat diagram, and it's something I never did. This this technique has probably just come about in the last 10 years, but it uses um, bioinformatics. And bioinformatics is really the ability to use computer programs and that kind of thing, along with quantification of signals, to be able to look at different gene expression. You can use bioinformatics in a lot of things, but this one is gene expression, and this is called a heat map. And what you have here is across, uh, in the hor horizontal direction, these are all different types of cells. And then vertically, these are all different genes that might be found in these cells. And the brighter the red, the higher the level of expression of that particular gene. So what you can see is every single cell type that you see here has a different pattern, and I wouldn't call it a fingerprint, because that actually is something in biology, but it's kind of a signature. So each cell type has its own signature of gene expression. So if you think about it, there are certain um, kinds of proteins that all cells have. All cells have a shape. And that shape is brought about by certain kinds of structural proteins that form scaffolds inside the cells. So you would expect to see those kinds of proteins and those genes expressed in all the cells you're looking at. But on the other hand, a neuron will have a gene for a neurotransmitter. A muscle cell will have a gene for a particular kind of contractile protein that are only found in muscle cells, and the hepatic cell will only have uh, genes turned on in addition to the ones that are always turned on to make um, digestive enzymes. You're not going to see all those things turned on in all those different kinds of cells. That's what makes the cells different, which genes are expressed in those cells. And as I said, this is a really neat technique that obviously allows you to look at lots and lots of cells and lots and lots of genes all at the same time. So, we now know that cells differentiate um, we think, at least up to this point, that that differentiation is irreversible and we know what a stem cell is. A stem cell is a cell that can not only renew itself but can differentiate into a different kind of adult cells. And I'll use the word somatic for adult cells. You have the, the fertilized egg, and then you have the somatic cell. Somatic, soma is body. So you have the cells of the body. But now I'm going to talk a little bit about the experiments that were actually the kind of breakthrough experiments that ultimately led to the current work that's being done in the adult stem cell field. And this was actually a cloning experiment. And this was done way back in 1952. So a major question in the field of developmental biology is how do cells differentiate? Why does this cell become a skin cell and this cell become a muscle cell? And very early on there was some thought that perhaps the way this happened is that um, 
some of the nuclear material was lost over time. So when you became a two-celled embryo, each cell got half of the genetic material in the nucleus. And when you became eight cells, each cell had only an eighth of what was found in the nucleus. So the questions that scientists began, began to ask was, well, are nuclei all the same or not? You know, if we could show that nuclei were all the same, then that would, that would give us some information. So there was, this was an early experiment, and this gentleman really um, did it to perfect a technique that he could use later on to answer that question about whether all nuclei were the same or whether they were different as the embryo continued to develop. Briggs and King, uh, they were in the United States. I think they were in Indiana, actually. And what they did is they used the frog called Rana Pippins. And they developed a technique that it sounds, sounds easy, but I can imagine the meticulousness and the eye-hand coordination that was required to do it. They took an egg and they removed the nucleus from an egg. All this obviously needs to be done under the microscope. Then they took a cell from a blastocyst. Now a blastocyst is an embryo just at the stage where it's a ball of cells. They took one of those cells and they removed the nucleus from it. And they took the nucleus from that one blastula cell and they injected it back into the egg. And what they were looking for was, all right, can this cell from the blastula now cause this egg to develop into a frog? If it could develop into a frog, it would mean nothing was lost from the nucleus during the early stages of development. It would mean everything was there that was needed in the nucleus, and there was something else that was going on that was causing differentiation to take place. And what they found was when they did this experiment with these early embryos that were just a ball of cells, when they took the nucleus out of one of those cells, they got some swimming tadpoles. About half of those eggs developed to a ball stage themselves, and of those, a certain percentage went on to become tadpoles. Now that was pretty cool and that would make you think that the nucleus must contain all of the genetic information to direct development because you could take a nucleus out of, the, out of a 128 cell embryo and get it to direct the development of an egg again. Well, but then he, uh, Briggs and King tried to do these experiments on a little later embryos. They took the embryos with the three layers that are a little later. They took nuclei out of those and they got very little successful development when they did that. So at that point, not quite sure. Does the nucleus contain all of the developmental information no matter when you take it out of the embryo, or is it only at the earliest stages? Is something being lost with later development? So then along comes Gurdon, uh, who I believe was at Cambridge, and he actually took advantage of the technique of cloning that Briggs and King had developed. He was a different species of frog, and he used adult cells. He took adult, first he started with intestinal epithelium cells. He took a nucleus out of an adult uh, intestinal epithelial cell, put it into a frog's egg that had been enucleated. Enucleated means the nucleus had been removed from it. He put the intestinal epithelial cell inside that egg and he got some swimming tadpoles. Those adult nuclei were able to direct the development of a whole, to the point of a whole swimming tadpole. Now you can see this experiment shows a skin cell. Well, people didn't believe Gurdon. After all, Briggs and King couldn't get it to work after a certain point in time. So why are they going to believe Gurdon in England who's doing these experiments? So instead he tried them again using a skin cell. And so a skin cell would have a pigment to it. 
So you would really know that the nucleus you were taking was coming out of that skin cell. When he was doing the experiments with intestinal cells, people said, oh, well, maybe he's not really getting an intestinal cell. Maybe there are some early cells in there and he's getting those. But when he used the stem cell, he was able to show that was exactly where he was getting those nuclei from. And again, he was giving, getting swimming tadpoles. So these are both cloning experiments done in frogs that ultimately show that the nucleus contains all of the information necessary to direct the development of a whole organism, to make cells differentiate into all of the different cell types that there are. Now I always can't resist talking about Dolly, because when Dolly was cloned in 1996, it was a huge um, deal, and the newspapers ran with this one for weeks and months, and then dogs were cloned, and cats were cloned, and all kinds of things were cloned. And of course, those of us in developmental biology said, what's the big deal? This was done 30 years ago in a frog. <laughs> Well, the, the big deal, I suppose you could call it, is it had never been done in a mammal before. And so this was the first time a mammal had been cloned. And what they used to clone Dolly were cells from the mammary gland. So they took, they used two different um, species of sheep so that they could tell by looking at the genes um, which nucleus or or which nucleus the new embryo came from. And what they were, what Brit, what um, these guys also in, in England or Scotland, I guess, were able to show was that they were actually able to get a complete sheep by using the, an egg from a Scottish blackface and the nucleus from an adult again an adult cell, a differentiated cell, mammary gland cell. And they got Dolly. Now one of the things that you need to know is yeah this can be done. It's been done in lots of different species now. Probably the efficiency of this is maybe between one and five percent. So you know you need a hundred eggs to get to get one dolly, basically. And the other thing that's interesting to note is that dolly, you go, there, I don't know a lot about sheep, but dolly appears to have died prematurely. She died at the age of eight. She had really bad arthritis and a bunch of other problem as w problems as well. And, you know, and some of that may be the result of of the fact that she was cloned and there might have been some, some genetic issues that were related to that that didn't show up until later. But I always have to talk about Dolly because Dolly is kind of um, the point in the field where everybody now has, has said, aha, developmental biology and cloning, this is happening. You know, this is amazing stuff. And everyone now is more focused on this field than they were back when I was doing it, back in the 1980s and 90s kind of thing. So, as I said, what we now know are genes aren't lost during the development and the nucleus from a differentiated cell, like an intestinal cell or a skin cell or a mammary gland cell, can be what we call reprogrammed back to that pluripotent early state where then if you treat them the right way, they can go on and become a different kind of differentiated cell. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Yeah. I want to make sure I... So here's a good point for me to mention um, what one of my basic take-home messages is every time I talk to um, an audience where there aren't a lot of scientists in the audience. And that is a lot of major breakthroughs that impact what we know about human disease and how we can treat human disease come from basic biological research. No one sets out to say, um, I want to clone a sheep just for the heck of cloning a sheep. 
they ask the question, I want to understand more about differentiation. I want to understand if a nucleus is altered or not during the course of development. And it is during the process of trying to understand more about the mechanisms of development that you sometimes have these amazing findings that later on become breakthroughs in the field of biomedicine. So I always kind of like to make that point. I remember when I was working on my master's degree, I was working on salamander fertilization. And I remember my smart aleck brother-in-law saying, so who cares about salamander fertilization? And even then, when I was much, much younger, I knew enough to say, well, if I understand how this works in a salamander, if I understand how, fer how sperm are able to penetrate eggs in a salamander, that could help us to understand how that happens in a human. And Obviously, over the years, they have come to understand that, and it has helped a lot with, with methods for in vitro fertilization and also methods to inhibit contraception as well. So out of basic research comes those breakthroughs that end up changing our lives and our health sometimes. So this whole um, cloning thing and showing that that differentiation can be reversible led to a new thought. Can we use stem cells to renew damaged tissue and cure disease? I like to talk about the search for the holy grail. And by the way, we talk about tissue regeneration. So tissue regeneration is just what it sounds like, being able to take stem cells and regenerating new cardiac muscle or regenerating um, new neuronal networks. And in fact, you'll see that a lot, there are people now who call themselves regenerative scientists. And there's a field of regenerative medicine and lots of very well-known medical schools all over the country have institutes of regenerative medicine and what they are all doing is studying stem cells because there are so many um, ways that we believe now stem cells are going to help us to understand disease, help us to discover new drugs, and perhaps even eventually help us to treat diseases. So there are several different kinds of stem cells, and the ones that most people know about um, are embryonic stem cells, because those are the ones that have made their way over the years into the newspaper and into um, the controversy over whether or not scientists should be using embryonic stem cells. So embryonic stem cells are just as they sound like from the embryo. I showed you the development of a frog, but mammals develop a little bit differently. And the way mammals develop is they have an outer layer of cells, and that outer layer of cells goes on to become the placenta. And then there's a little mass of cells inside that's called the inner cell mass. And the entire embryo develops from that little small mass inside. And embryonic stem cells are made by removing cells from that inner cell mass growing them up in, in culture, and now you have embryonic stem cells that if you treat them the right way, you can get them to differentiate into other cell types. You can get them to differentiate to cardiac cells, into neuronal cells, into hepatic cells, into many, many different cell types, and that's because since they're from a very early stage embryo, they're pretty close to being totipotent. They have that ability to become almost any kind of cell in the body or actually any cell in the body. So those are the embryonic stem cells and before I came down I double checked when they were first isolated. They were first isolated in mice in 1981 and then not until 1998 from humans. And actually I remember probably in the early 90s I was studying a protein that I believed was important in the development of the cardiovascular system. The reason I believed that was because I was able to track development I use chicken embryos in a chicken embryo and show that this particular protein showed up in the heart 
and in cells that went on to become um, endothelial cells or capillary cells at particular stages in development. So usually if a protein or a gene is expressed at a particular time, very often that tells you something about the fact that it might play a role in that particular um, time in development. And so I remember there's a, there's a place that you can get cell lines called the American Tissue Culture Consortium or something like that. I don't remember what the second C was. But there are, hun there are thousands and thousands of different cells you can get from this organization that you can then grow up in your lab and treat however you want. And I remember taking mouse embryonic stem cells, they would send them to you in a test tube, and you would put them in a dish with the right kinds of nutrients, and, and watch to see whether or not you could get them to differentiate. And because I believed my um, molecule, wasn't my molecule, but my molecule was involved in cardiac development, I would treat these dishes of cells with the protein that I was studying to see if I could get cardiac cells to develop. Anyone have an idea how you know if you have a dish full of cardiac cells? Anyone know? Any of the biologists in the room? So if you have a dish of real cardiac myocytes, cardiac muscle cells, they begin to beat. And when they form a monolayer where they're all touching each other, they beat synchronously. So when they're kind of just spread on the dish here and there, this one is beaten like this, and this one's got a little bit of a different beat. But once they make contact with each other, they all take on the same beat. And that's how you know you have a dish of cardiac muscle cells, cardiac myocytes. Well, I never saw that. And soon after, I became an administrator. <laughs> since then, I have to say that since then, what I've learned is that that protein that I was studying has been shown to be involved in cardiac development. And in fact, they're using it as part of a cocktail to take some stem cells and make them cardiac cells. I just didn't know how to do it and didn't know where all the other right nutrients were that were supposed to be there at the time. It was 20 years ago now. Then there's something called adult stem cells. And there's still a lot of controversy about whether they exist or not. You know, um, for a long time, people were certain there was no such thing as an adult stem cell, with the exception of, you know, skin turns over very, very quickly. Obviously, there must be skin stem cells. Blood turns over very, very quickly. We know there are blood stem cells in the bone marrow. But people did not believe there were anything like neuronal stem cells or cardiac stem cells or muscle stem cells. And for a while, back in the early 2000s, there was a flurry of work being done that made people think there were likely cardiac stem cells in neuronal stem cells. I think later research um, is the thinking now is that they're not actually stem cells. They're cells in a tissue that can can divide and then differentiate. So they're kind of a pool of cells, but they're not stem cells um, from the perspective of being pluripotent. They can't become lots of different cell types. The thinking now is that maybe there are some cardiac stem cells. The only things they're going to do is, is become cardiac cells. They come to the rescue when tissue is damaged, basically. So that field maybe doesn't have as much promise for taking a cell, um, making it pluripotent, and then make, growing it up in large numbers and making it any kind of cell you want. Then there was something called mesenchymal bone marrow cells. And these were cells that were not blood cells in the bone marrow, but some of the other cells that are found in the bone marrow that people believed were pluripotent. And as I read the literature, I think they now believe that while they become, become all the different types of skeletal cells that exist, bone cells and cartilage cells and some other connective tissue cells, they can't become other kinds of cells cells outside of that cell lineage or group of cell fates that's related to skeleton. What appears like it might be the holy grail, although a whole lot of work is still being done on embryonic stem cells, are these things called induced pluripotent stem cells. 
Um, the name in itself is kind of daunting to understand what that means. And these are adult cells that can be reprogrammed back to almost an embryonic state. They can be de-differentiated. Remember I said we didn't think the arrows could go that way. The arrows could only go that way. But these are cells that you can reprogram back to an undifferentiated or embryonic-like state and then um, by using particular signals, sometimes you actually have to get genes inside the cells, sometimes you can grow them in a particular cocktail of molecules, you can get them to go on to become a differentiated cell. Um, induced because they, an induction needs to take place. You have to force them back to an embryonic state and then you have to induce them to become a new differentiated cell type. And that well, really appears to have a lot of potential and there's a ton of work being done on those cells right now because none of this stuff is easy. You have to figure out what kinds of chemicals they need to grow in. Sometimes you need to grow them with another kind of cell. There, there might be another kind of cell that produces just the right signal that those cells need. Well, now you have two kinds of cells in a dish and you've got to um, purify those cells that are just helping your cells grow from the ones that you want. You have to make sure that you're turning on the right genes so they're differentiating along the pathway you want them to. So none of this sounds easy and work is continuing just on being able to get decent populations of these induced stem cells. Now they can become um, there are several types of cells that they've been able to show they easily become. It turns out that these induced stem cells can fairly easily become cardiac cells and neuronal cells, nervous system cells. They can also become blood cells. They can also become hepatocytes. Those are the things that require the least manipulation to get them to go down those pathways. So, pluripotent stem cells, the Nobel Prize actually was awarded to Shinya Yamanaka, but also Gurdon. Remember Gurdon from the frog experiment earlier? The two of them together were awarded the Nobel Prize in 2012. And obviously, hopefully now you can see the bigger picture that Gurdon's work really laid the foundation for this work Yamanaka did where he was able to reprogram adult skin cells back to an embryonic like state. First he did it with mouse and then he did it with humans and they can show that these cells that were skin cells when you reprogram that them back to an embryonic like state can go on and become cells of any of those three germ layers. Remember we said those three germ layers each was responsible for different tissue types in the body. And there are a couple of ways to show that. They can grow cells in dishes and do genetic analysis and show what kinds of genes they're expressing. There are also things you can do like inject them into a mouse and they'll form teratomas. And teratomas are kind of benign tumors that become that contain cells from a lot of different organ, from a lot of different tissues. They can be kind of funny looking. They can have a little cluster of beating heart cells, and they can have cells shooting hair out of them, and they can have a little cluster of liver cells. You know, terra, teratoma, kind of um, monster-like, and that's where that name comes from. They're these weird monster-like clusters of cells. So you can take these. Um, induced adult skin cells, you make them embryonic-like, you inject them under the skin of a mouse embryo, and they form these embryo-like things that have all these tissues in them, but not organized necessarily into a nice embryo, at least not in the early days of showing that these cells can produce all of the cells from all three germ layers. But I thought it was interesting, I was wondering why Briggs and King didn't win this um, Nobel Prize at all. And I don't know if they would have or not, but as my husband pointed out to me, 
um, the award, the, the, the prize is not given posthumously, and both Briggs and King were um, long gone by 2012, actually. So I don't know if that's why or if there was some other reason why they wouldn't have gotten it if they were still with us. So this is just a little schematic of how making induced pluripotent stem cells work. You take a differentiated somatic cell, remember, cell of the body, skin cell, um, maybe white blood cell. Um, those are, if you think about it, those are the easiest ones. Wouldn't it be great if you could just take a little skin bi biopsy or take a mill of blood? de-differentiate those cells, make them any kind of cell that you want them to be. I mean, that's the hope. That's the holy grail, really, that we'll be able to do that at some time. You can reprogram them back to an embryo-like state, and then they're, that's when they're called the induced pluripotent stem cell. And then remember, they're stem cells, so they can renew themselves. They can keep growing, and some of them can be, will be, you can differentiate into all of these different cell types. So, how, why the big hoopla about stem cells these days? I won't separate embryonic from induced, but obviously this has a lot of great potential because you'll be able to get these cells without being invasive, really, um, from an individual. And if you think about it, if I need, and we're nowhere near here yet, so I'm not saying we are, but if I have a damaged heart, if I have cardiac hypertrophy, um, we could take a skin biopsy, we could de-differentiate those cells into pluripotent stem cells, we could grow large numbers of them, maybe we grow them on some kind of scaffold, three-dimensional kind of scaffold, we differentiate them back into cardiac myocytes, and they're my cardiac myocytes. They have my genes. They're not like my immune system is not likely to try to fight them off because they're me. So think about it. That could be a, a huge breakthrough in modern medicine if we can get to that point where those kinds of things are happening. But there are a bunch of other ways you can use embryon you can use stem cells as well. And some of them, while they might not be direct treatment of disease, they are going to aid in drug discovery. So, for example, one of the big parts of drug discovery is, cyto is toxicity. A lot of drugs are either really toxic to the liver or really toxic to the heart. Well, imagine if the way you could study toxicity of drugs you're trying to develop is just by having dishes and dishes and thousands of dishes of heart cells or liver cells and being able to test all of those potential drugs directly on those cells. And in fact, one of the articles I was reading, there's actually a company now that is selling I think it's cardiomyocytes. They're selling cardiac cells for that very purpose, to be used by pharmaceutical companies for toxicity studies. So, you know, the stem cells in that case aren't being used to cure human disease, but they are being used to hasten the pace of drug discovery and to also probably someday limit the number of clinical trials that have to be done because very often toxicity is a part of clinical trials as well. How high a dose can you use to get an effect and not harm the patient too much anyway? So. The other things that you can do with these is we, um, I, I've seen it referred to as disease in a dish. So we use a lot of animal models to study disease. But the problem sometimes with animal models is they're not exactly like the disease we have as humans. They mimic that disease. So they're not perfect models. And even when they are perfect models, sometimes because of their metabolism, um, for example, the heartbeat of a mouse is, you know, X number of times faster than a human. When you look at uh, potential drugs on these animal models, they may not be um, giving you the same kinds of results as they would in a human. But imagine if you had dishes of cells from a thousand different humans and you could test the same drug on a thousand different humans by looking at using a disease in a dish. 
it would it someday could decrease the clinical trials that would need to be done. Our clinical trials perhaps would just be the latter part of the drug discovery process and not happen so early in the drug discovery process. The other thing people are using them for is to just study disease. So there are now a number um, of diseases where they've been able to take cells of human skin cells, de-differentiate them, and re-differentiate them in most of the, these, course, these um, diseases into a kind of nervous system cell, neuronal cells. And the reason they're doing that is because they're trying to understand the disease. If they can recapitulate the development of the cells, um, prior to the disease happening, they may find out, oh, well, this is interesting. This gene is turned on abnormally in the cells from the patient with Huntington's disease. They're turned on at a different time than the cells in the normal patient. So maybe this is the disease target that we should look, be looking for a drug to discover. So these can be used to look for targets for drugs. They can be used just to study um, disease and get a better understanding of disease. They can be used for cyto, they can be used for toxicity studies. Um, as I said before, someday we hope that we can actually use them for treatment. And I, small molecules on cellular targets, this is again part of drug discovery. So there are things happening every day in this field. And one of the things that I was able to do before I came down was to find a, a nice timeline of stem cells. And you remember that Yamanaka made the first induced pluripotent stem cells in 2006 in mice, in 2007 in human. But then we skipped down to 2010, and a lot of this is happening in dishes right now, in culture dishes reprogramming mouse non-muscle cells into beating heart cells, converting human skin cells directly to human blood cells. Um, in 2012, this is an interesting one, scar tissue that formed after a heart attack can be reprogrammed, de-differentiated into induced pluripotent stem cells, and reprogrammed into beating heart cells in living animals. Um, you can reprogram skin cells from Huntington's patients and a cell culture model. That's what I was talking about before. And there are a couple of clinical trials. Do I have that here? Yes, coming soon. Age-related macular degeneration. I think that clinical trial, if I remember correctly, is going to be happening in Japan and potentially Parkinson's disease too. So the first two human clinical trials are on the horizon using these induced pluripotent stem cells. At the same time, they keep on trying to work on methods to make it easier to make these stem cells, to make it more reproducible to make these stem cells. And you can see there's actually an animal model where they've been able to kill, cure sickle cell in a mouse by taking, by reprogramming cells back to pluripotent stem cells, skin cells, I believe, um, adding the genes, doing genetic engineering to put the right gene in these cells as opposed to the gene that causes the sickle cell disease and then injecting that back into the mouse and getting red blood cells now that are sickle gene free. And that has been done now in um, animal models. They've been able to take human uh, cells that they have differentiated into neuronal cells and that basically, it, I think this study, they showed that it improved the gait of Parkinson's mice so that they were walking better and that kind of thing. And then in, in ALS, there's also been some work that's actually been done on the whole mouse now. So there is great potential for um, adult stem cells and stem cells in general. And I just wanted to, I was amazed that when I Googled stem cells, here's an article, February 2014. 
um, reprogramming skin cells into beating heart cells, 2014. There's another one about being able to reprogram skin cells into hepatocytes, which are liver cells, and growing them on a scaffold. So there is huge potential for this. It's not going to be tomorrow that we are going to see diseases being cured using stem cells, but certainly they're going to increase the pace of drug discovery and, and helping to cure human disease. And hopefully 10 years from now, if someone comes back and talks to you about this again, there will be some major breakthroughs and they will be able to talk about the results of these clinical trials and the success of these clinical trials. So thank you. <laughs> Questions? Dave. Um, what exactly, what exactly uh, is the advantage uh, of using induced cells uh, rather than embryonic stem cells? Well, that's an interesting question. Obviously, um, one advantage is you bypass all the uh, ethical controversy that's going on about embryonic stem cells. But really? I, I mean, that's one, and you read that. People, when you read the articles, they talk about that. But I think the really important one is what I said before. It's totally, it's, it's, no, it's non-invasive, and it's your own cells. So likely, if you, if you get transplanted with your own cells, you're not going to, um, you know, your immune system isn't going to fight them off. You're not going to have a kind of graft versus host response. Early on, there was some fear in the work they were doing in mice that there was some graft versus host response, but as it appears that as they've gotten better and better at this, some of the more recent studies they did to look at that um, showed that that wasn't the case. So that's really the major. I mean, I'm not being facetious, though, about the other one because articles usually do point that out, too, as an advantage. But I think the main biological advantage is itself. And it's not that invasive. You can take a mill of blood, you can take a little skin punch, and you can get it. So what's the advantage of using now, the embryonic cells rather than the induced cells? Well, because the, we know that we, it's not yet been showed that those pluripotent cells can become every single type of cell. Um, we know, as I said, they can very easily become cardiac cells and hepatocytes, which is really nice because those are the two things where drug toxicity is greatest in. So it's great that we can make large numbers of those. They also can do neurons in blood. I'm not sure that it's been easy to get them to differentiate into other kinds of cells yet that we might be interested in. The embryonic cells are, are truly totipotent. Now, there's also another disadvantage to the embryonic cells. I don't think you can grow them yet without a feeder kind of cell. You know, I talked about the fact that sometimes you actually need another kind of cell growing right alongside them in order to get them to do what you want to do. And that was the case for embryonic stem cells, and I think it still is. So that's another disadvantage to those. But the advantage is that um, I think scientists believe they really can become any kind of cell that we might want them to become. Yes? Is there any work being done on regenerating brain cells? Neurons. Just a neuron? Okay. Yeah. So, and in fact, and I think some of these, like the Parkinson's disease study I talked about, if I'm not mistaken, those were actually um, neurons that they then injected I think, I could be wrong about this, into the brains of those mice. And like I said, it, it kind of improved their gait when they did that. So remember, you're not transplanting a brain. What you're doing is you're providing some normal tissue in a place where there's damaged tissue. How often are they using animal cells to cure or to work on a human body? The cells as opposed to the whole animal? Um, not that much yet. It's all of that kind of work that's really done. 
it depends on what stages of drug discovery because when you're talking about cures you're actually talking about drug discovery in the very early stages of drug discovery when they're just testing compounds they very often start out by testing those compounds on animal cells but some of the work we're talking about here is very very new and has only been done for the last three or four years really but very often kind of that's the first stage you have animal cells you have animal models that there's about a fourth stage that's my presentation tomorrow there's about a four or five stage process to uh, drug discovery that can take as much as a decade and during some of the very early phases of that there could be animals animal cells used to try to find, to try to identify the right target drugs for cells yes Mm -hmm. I know people, though, that have had stem cell transplants 20 years blood, cell blood stem cell transplants. So you're absolutely right. That is um, very different from induced pluripotent stem cells. As I said early on, that what we're all most familiar with in terms of a stem cell are the cells in the bone marrow. So at the bone marrow normally contains stem cells. I used to know this. I don't anymore. But I think a red cell turns over every 90 days or something. So you have to have a source of cells to be able to keep replacing the red blood cells, the white blood cells. So yes, blood stem cells, we know they exist, and people have, and it's been a godsend for people with cancer. You're, you, have, you have had a, a stem, uh, bone marrow transplant? Yeah, my husband's a hematologist. So. Okay, but also blood, blood cells, yeah. 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 yeah, so the bone marrow of the blood contains all the progenitors to all the kinds of white blood cells as, a lot, as well as all the kinds of, all of the, well, the one kind of red blood cells in the platelets. So, and sometimes you find, also can find some of those early stage blood cells circulating as well. Is that what they did with you? They took circulating cells? Okay, okay. Um, but I, I'm still out to lunch on how they separate these things and know which, who knows how to get where, you know. How you get the right ones right. and the ones that you don't want in your body, you don't get in your yeah. body. Yeah, I wish my husband, the hematologist, was here tonight. He could uh -huh. explain that to you. <laughs> Other questions? So the difference is, is that most of these are cells that, uh, the la most of the cells I talked about were some sort of already mature cell that we pushed back to be embryonic-like and then made them into a different kind of cell. The blood cells are a different case. They already exist in kind of that stemish, stemish form. Well, thank you. Oh, Patty. What started your interest? You talked about grade school and being fascinated with cells and first learning about cells. So what sparked your interest going into this type of... Um, developmental biology in particular, a fabulous professor in college. A really amazing professor um, when I took developmental biology and then when I was a senior I worked in his lab. And that was, that was what really sparked my interest. Dave, did you have another question? Yes. Uh, as long as you raise the ethical issue. Uh oh. Just <laughs> <laughs> the philosopher. Yeah. Uh, I'm just curious um, uh, how much are the restrictions of the previous uh, administrations of restrictions on the use of embryonic stem cells, how much do those restrictions? Uh, retard um, uh, 
our basic research and understanding of well, certainly they slow down our, our, our greater understanding of embryonic stem cells and their use. You know, there are still these, I don't know how many, 20 different cell lines that were already in existence before the law came into being. And there were still people all over the country, um, including Harvard, that are working on those 20 cell lines. But the inability to be able to generate more of those cell lines, you know, I would think if I were in that field, I would be frustrated by it and it probably, not probably, it would impact your, slow down and impact your ability to, to ask all the questions you can think of because you really don't have um, all, of the, all of this to work with. You have a very limited number of sources of cells that you can work with. In fact, I did know someone um, who was at Harvard, who really became very, very well known through the work he had done at embryonic stem cells. And I don't know why he's not working on them very much anymore, but his lab in particular is pretty much, from what I understand, all working with these induced pluripotent stem cells now. But there are other people who were still plugging away with the embryonic stem cells because, as I said, there really is that huge potential with them. Well, somebody's going to probably make a lot of money for sure. I don't know about the a lot of people aren't going to live side of it. Um, as I said, a lot of what I'm talking about here someday could actually decrease the number of clinical trials that need to be done or the earlier stage clinical trials that need to be done. So probably fewer people, um, you know, may suffer as the result of of something, you know, an early stage clinical trial or something. I was thinking of um, the, the, the cancer, the, the um, DNA testing for the cervical cancer, or whatever, I can't remember which cancer it is, that cost like $7,000 to test because this particular company has um, a patent on that gene. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but it, it, this, com this company has a patent on a gene. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things that um, it doesn't make it right, and there's a lot that, of work to be done in healthcare, but I'm giving a presentation tomorrow where I'm talking about drug discovery. And pharmaceutical companies, ha it's a multi, it costs them multi billions of dollars a year to to discover new drugs and put new drugs in the pipeline. So part of that, part of that huge expense is related to, I think, you know, I don't know this personally, but is related to their wanting to be able to recoup some of the investment they put into developing these drugs. Oh, that's right. And there is a tremendous <laughs> And they know that they've only got X number of years to recoup that yeah. because eventually it goes generic and then anybody can make it. So they've got to they've got to recoup that expense while they can. So that that's part of it. It's not and greed certainly plays a role. Too, but that, that yeah, and then there are these drugs that are really only they're almost like designer drugs. There's really only a small number of people who can benefit from them. And so again, if you're spending, you know, multi millions of dollars to develop that drug and you've got a thousand patients across the country who are going to be able to use it, I mean being a scientist I would say, do I not develop that drug or do I develop it and at least try to make it available to people? I don't know. But it's a, it's a point well taken. And of course, um, one of the things that I've been thinking about too with this other presentation is access to drugs. So does everybody have access who, to that $7,000 drug who needs it? So that's another piece of that one. Yeah. No. 
That's, I'm, I'm teaching a class tomorrow night. I really appreciate you all coming, and I, I'm thrilled that you had questions for me. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank you.